Hello, my name is Daniel Rollins, and it is such an honor to be able to talk to you today about one of the greatest speeches in American history given by one of the greatest Americans in our history, and that, of course, is the I Have a Dream speech given by Dr. Martin Luther King on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on August 8, 1963. It is a speech that is part prose, part poetry, and certainly part prophecy as it set the stage for greater endeavors in the civil rights movement, civil rights movement, and certainly gives us a picture of what a unified America could really look like. So we have to ask the question, what kind of person is, is elected to give such a speech like this? Who has chosen to give such a speech on such a great day at such a great event as Martin Luther King. Well, we have to understand who Martin Luther King was. And there you see him as a young boy. We know some things about Martin when he was a boy. First of all, his name was not Martin. Did you know that? His name was actually Michael King. His father, Michael Sr., was the pastor at Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and had the opportunity to attend a conference in Germany with other Baptist ministers. And while in Germany at these series of conferences, he walked in the steps of the great Christian reformer Martin Luther, who helped change the face of the world, really, and the, certainly the face of Christianity. And so when Michael King came back to the United States, came back to Atlanta, Georgia, he decided that he too wanted to be a reformer and help reform the country for his people. So he traded his name. He took the name of Martin Luther King Sr. and thus had to change the name of his son to Martin Luther King Jr. And that happened when Martin Luther King Jr. was around five years old. A couple of other things that we know about his childhood is that certainly being born in the South in 1929, just before the Great Depression, he suffered very strident racism. We know that when he was a boy, five or six years old, he had a best friend who lived across the street. His the best friend's father ran the store from across the street from where the kings lived, and, and he was a white young man. And, and King and this little boy were, were inseparable. They played together every single day until they started school. When the white boy went to one school and King went to another school, and suddenly the little white boy stopped showing up to play. King finally ran into him and asked him, Why have you stopped playing with me? And the little boy said, Because my father said I had to because you're black and I'm white. We also know that King went to Dublin, Georgia for an oratorical contest one time and won the contest with a speech called The Negro and the Constitution. And in, in the wake of his victory, he has to ride 90 miles on the bus back to Atlanta with his teacher, and both of them were made to stand so that white passengers could have their seats. At that point, King resolved that he would hate white people for the rest of his life because how could he love a race of people who absolutely hated him? We also know that King was extremely precocious. We know that at only 15 years of age, he started college at Morehouse University in Atlanta, Georgia as a sociology major. And in between his sophomore and junior years, decided that like his father, he was going to enter the ministry. And here you see King looking very dapper in his cap and gown at Morehouse, still a very young man. But he decides that he's going to go to seminary at a place called Crozier Seminary in Chesterton, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, of course, is not the South. It is the North. And while he was there, King realized that racism in the North was a little bit different than it was in the South. There were some things that were, were relaxed. It wasn't as strident. In fact, that he could mingle uh, and socialize with people of all different colors, all different races, all different religions. In fact, we know that his hatred of white people must had dissolved by this time because, in a little known fact, uh, King dated a, a white girl and was going to marry her, had every intention of marrying her. But then his father and some other very wise advisors said, you know, maybe you need to rethink this. This may not be good for your career as a minister, especially if you were to come back south. 
and King dissolved that relationship. But it was while at Crozier, Crozier that he was introduced to Gandhi and the, the writings, a study of Gandhi and nonviolence and other social theologians, social Christian theologians like Niebuhr and Rauschenbusch and, and really studied pacifism for the very first time. Well, he graduated first in his class from Crozier and then had to make a decision. Was he going to immediately enter the ministry or was he going to become an academic? So he decided to go to Boston University, very prestigious, and pursue his doctorate. And while he was there, he met two people who would be very formidable influences in his life and certainly in his career as a warrior for civil rights. The first one was a man named Harold DeWolf. Dr. Harold DeWolf was a white man and he was King's mentor and advisor and would be for several years after King uh, left Boston University and began fighting for civil rights. The second person was a lovely young lady from the New England Conservatory of Music who was planning on a brilliant career on opera stages across the world. But King met her, and her name was Coretta Scott. And King saw her and fell absolutely in love with her. And I have to tell you, to be honest, King was kind of a ladies' man. He had dated a lot of women, but when he saw Coretta Scott, he was smitten. And soon they began to date and were engaged and were later married at the Ebenezer Church by King's father. Now, towards the end of his studies at Boston University, King decided to take a pastorate, and he took that pastorate in Montgomery, Alabama at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. That would be a very fateful decision for King because he was only there a little over a year when in that same town in December, December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks, a young woman named Rosa Parks, got on a bus in Montgomery and sat down in the front of the bus. Now, we all know, if we know our history, that blacks were not allowed to sit in the front of the bus. The bus driver turned around. He said, ma'am, you're going to have to go to the back of the bus. And Rosa Parks said, no, I'm not. I'm tired. I'm going to sit right here. At the next stop, the bus driver stopped the bus, called a policeman, and had her arrested. Now, that was the very spark that people in Montgomery and across Alabama were waiting for to draw attention to the plight of African Americans in this country and their lack of civil rights. Martin Luther King was gaining prominence as a pastor in the town and would certainly be one of the people who was going to help lead the civil rights demonstrations that were going to take place in that town. And they did. There were several nonviolent demonstrations that took place for a year. What kind? We'll get back to that in just a moment because we need to know about two people who were very formidable again in King's life and certainly again in his career in civil rights. This is Ralph Abernathy. Abernathy, a fellow pastor, would become King's right-hand man, his wingman, his very best friend, and would fight for civil rights alongside King literally until King drew his final breath. The second person who had such a great influence on King was Baron Rustin. Rustin was an interesting character. Rustin had been in the civil rights fight really for 20 years or more already. He was older than King, as you can see in the photo. Rustin was interesting. Rustin was a pacifist, and he was very dedicated to his pacifism. In fact, in World War II, when he was drafted, he refused to serve in combat and in the military, and so he was sent to jail, and that's the price he was willing to pay for his pacifism. He was also, during this time, openly homosexual, which is, is not something that, that was really kind of out there at that time. People didn't really come out of the closet and expose them, themselves that way, but he did. And he made uh, no apologies for it and was also arrested uh, on, on several occasions for his uh, sexual practices and proclivities. So he was a man, whether you would agree with him or not, uh, in, in either of those areas, he was a man who was not afraid to stand up for himself and stand up for his rights. And this is what he said to King. He said, you know, you can talk the talk about nonviolence and pacifism, or you can walk the walk, and now is the time to walk the walk. 
And so he's instructed King. He says, we're going to have to teach people nonviolence, and this is what we're going to do. We're not going to ride the buses in Montgomery. No black person's going to ride the bus. And that was the plan of action. And certainly for a year, black people in Montgomery did not get on a city bus. They, they walked to work in town. They took taxis. They rode together. But they didn't get on the bus. And the, some of them were arrested. They didn't get on the bus. Some of them were abused. And, and, but they didn't get on the bus. No, nobody, the, certainly the city and the city authorities, could not make them ride the bus. Well, soon, the, the, the people who owned the bus company, because it was an independent company, came to the city and said, Look, If you don't do something to stop this, if you don't get the African-American community back on the bus, you're not going to have a bus because we're going broke. And so soon, the people in Montgomery, the leaders of Montgomery, the, the white leaders in Montgomery succumbed and the buses were integrated. And we know that Martin Luther King was the first person to ride an integrated bus in Montgomery. He got on the bus that day. He says that the bus driver, who was white, greeted him very warmly, and he sat together with another reverend named Glenn Smiley, who was also a white man, and rode into town together. Now, for his efforts in Montgomery, King got a couple of things. First, he got his house bombed. Uh, that he was at church and, and his wife was there with their young child and the house was bombed, but fortunately no one was injured. But he also, in 1957, became the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which became a very, very formidable uh, group when it came to protesting and demonstrating for civil rights. He was their very first president. Now, Something else we need to know about the March on Washington in 63 is it wasn't the first march on Washington. There was a march prior, and it was in 1957. And it led King to meet someone else who would have a great influence on his life in civil rights, and that was A. Philip Randolph. Randolph had also been involved in civil rights for decades. In fact, in 1925, he organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was the first predominantly African-American labor union. Even more so, when World War II started in 1941, Randolph went to President Roosevelt and said, President Roosevelt, you should integrate the military. Roosevelt said, you know that's going to be a fight that I can't fight right now inside of our country when we have to fight the Japanese and the Germans. And so Randolph said, agreed, we can put that on the back burner, but African-American contractors must have an opportunity to work in the military defense manufacturing plants and, and get some of these contracts, and that's not happening right now. So Roosevelt actually signed an executive order banning discrimination in the defense industry against African-American contractors. Randolph fought for that. And it was Randolph who would help King, along with King and other civil rights leaders, who would organize a 1957 march on Washington that was about anywhere between 15 and 25,000 people strong. They congregated at the Lincoln Memorial, just as they would do in 1963. And there were celebrities there as well who did some entertaining. One of them was Mahalia Jackson. Mahalia Jackson was King's muse. When in times of trouble, he would call Jackson and he would say, just, just sing for me, and she would sing for him. Another noted personality celebrity was the suave Harry Belafonte. Belafonte was there, and he would have a great impact later on in some of the civil rights conflicts down in the South. And he would also appear at the 63 marches, I'll tell you momentarily. So King is going to enter into the fray, more or less, after Montgomery. There are other battles to be fought. He moves uh, from Dexter Avenue in Montgomery, moves to Atlanta, becomes co-pastor with his dad at Ebenezer, and, and again wants to fight for civil rights. And what was happening in 1960 is that, that gentlemen, uh, African-American gentlemen and ladies, would go sit at lunch counters where they were forbidden because they weren't white, such as at Woolworth. They would sit there and be arrested. King sat at a lunch counter in Atlanta in 1960. He was arrested 
And his sentence was he had to go to hard labor. He had to, he had to go to the farm. And one night about four o'clock, he was sleeping in his cell and was roused up by some deputies who threw him in a car and were driving him and taking him down to the farm for hard labor as punishment. Well, 1960 was an interesting year. It was an election year. And who got him out of kind of trouble? Who got him out of this? It was the Kennedys. It was John F. Kennedy who was running for president as a what? Remember, as a Democrat. And the party that was, was kind of causing a lot of the problems down south because the culture has changed, the times have changed. The, the, the party that was really holding on to the racist structure was the Democratic Party. Kennedy needed the black vote to become president. So he, he intervenes on the, the part of King and so does his brother Robert. And, and King never makes it to hard labor. In fact, he is, is freed. But King was a man of principle. You have to know this, right? He was a man of principle. And, and he said, you know... Uh, John, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that you've got me out of jail, but I'm not going to endorse you at this time because your civil rights record is no better than Richard Nixon's against whom you're running for president. And so he didn't endorse him, but certainly the African-American community was paying attention. And certainly their votes for Kennedy helped swing the election, and he won by the narrowest of margins. The next battle that King would fight would be in a place called Albany, Georgia. Now, in Montgomery, there had been some rough housing of, of blacks, some abuse of blacks physically. But here's Lori Pritchett. Lori Pritchett was the chief of police of Albany. And he said, you know what? We're not going to abuse anybody. We're not, we're not going to, to, to strike anybody. It's not going to be that way in Albany. We're going to be, if we have to arrest someone, we're going to be very respectful. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're not going to fight with them. There's going to be no violence in Albany. And they did. They had the, the police in Albany had to arrest some, some protesters and some demonstrators. They took them to jail. They were very kind. They were very considerate. They were very polite. In fact, King got arrested and he got put in jail. But he got bailed out, and the person who bailed him out was none other than Lori Pritchett, because Pritchett said, he's not going to sit in my jail and become a martyr. And so the civil rights demonstrations in Albany actually seemed to fail. They, they gained nothing for the African-American community, but King said that's, that's not really true. Because we've learned something in defeat. And what we learned is we went in and tried to get all the civil rights for all the African Americans. We can't do that. Like in Montgomery, we have to focus on one or two issues. And that brings us to 1963 and the city of Birmingham, the next great civil rights battlefield. Birmingham, Alabama, the most racist town in the United States during this time period. And this is what King and the other civil rights leaders said that they wanted. They simply wanted open public facilities so that their people, especially their children, could go into the parks and play, to have a place to play and enjoy. And they said they wanted the promotion of blacks in the local industries. And at the beginning of their protests and demonstrations, again, all nonviolent in that city, just as they had been in Albany, just as they had been in Montgomery. At the beginning, the police chief there, whose name was Bull Connor, as you see Bull Connor here looking very much like a bulldog, decided we're going to take Pritchett's tactic and, and be very polite and, and be good and everything's going to be fine. But Bull Connor was one of the most racist people you could ever imagine. And very soon he unleashed his police force and they would violently beat back the African-American demonstrators and put them into jail. They put literally hundreds of African-Americans in jail in Birmingham, including King, who was put in solitary confinement for three days. He could not talk to anybody, did not talk to anybody for three days. Finally, it was JFK, again, making a phone call, said, you better give his man, the man his rights. Uh, he has the right to talk to a lawyer and he needs to be able to talk with his wife. And finally, the people in Montgomery, or I'm sorry, in Birmingham, finally relented and King was able to talk. Well, who was going to bail all of these people out? There were over 200 people in the Birmingham jails. 
It was Harry Belafonte. Remember Belafonte, the entertainer. He had a lot of pull in the civil rights community up north and was able to gather friends together and raise enough money to bail out hundreds of people in Birmingham during this time. Well, violence had broken out, certainly white on on black, black on white. The blacks were retaliating, which King uh, did not like. He had not taught that, did not want that, knew they couldn't win by retaliating. But when he gets out of jail, they need a new tactic, the civil rights leaders do. So on May 2nd, 1963, they put into place something that was very controversial. The civil rights leaders sent out six thousand children into the streets of Birmingham, children and teenagers, on a children's march. Those children marched to the the courthouse. They would kneel. They would pray. But what happened is, again, Bull Connor couldn't stand to see it. He unleashed water hoses. Policemen beat them with, with clubs. Dogs attacked them. And this is children. And this is all in the eye of television because this is being recorded by the networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. People could see it all over the United States. Literally hundreds Hundreds of these children were put in jail to the point where they couldn't even get them in the police cars anymore. They had to call for buses to come from the local school to take them to jail. Finally, with the city being a battlefield, blood running in the streets, the city torn apart, city leaders finally said, we have to call a truce. This is ridiculous. This is crazy. This is anarchy. And finally, they agreed to desegregate public facilities And they agreed to the hiring and promotion of African Americans in commercial and industrial establishments. White extremists lost their minds. They began bombing places, houses, churches were bombed. A.D. King, who was Martin uh, King's brother, his house was bombed. King's Hotel, the the Gaston Hotel was bombed, even though King was not there at the time, but they did not know that. And then when that happens... Blacks begin to retaliate. And as they retaliate, the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, as you see here uh, over on uh, your your left-hand side, sent in the state state troopers, and the state troopers began to beat back the African-American demonstrators. And at this point, rioters. Now, we have to remember who George Wallace was. Do you remember George Wallace? George Wallace, on his inauguration, said this. He said, Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. He was a strict segregationist governor of Alabama. And only a few weeks before King would give his speech in Washington in 1963... Uh, Wallace had stood on the doorsteps of the school in Little Little Rock and would not let black students in until uh, JFK finally threatened him with the National Guard and shooed him away. So finally, Robert F. Kennedy, the Attorney General, sent in 3,000 federal troops, put them in position near Birmingham, and made uh, plans to federalize the Alabama National Guard to go in and keep the peace. Finally, the Alabama Supreme Court ran Bull Connor and his cronies out of office. They weren't supposed to be there. They were there illegally anyway, which is another story we don't have time for. And finally, tensions settled down and things come back to normal. Just a few days later, on June 11th of that same year, John F. Kennedy would request that Congress immediately enact the most comprehensive and sweeping civil rights bill to date. Eleven days later, on June 22nd, King is visiting with JFK in the White House, and Kennedy says, I'm going to support you on civil rights, but you have to understand this could cost me the election because in the last 11 days, my approval ratings have fallen from 60% to 47%. But Kennedy was true to his word. Finally, the next year, July 2nd, 1964, the Civil Rights Act would be signed into law. Of course, not by Kennedy, but by LBJ, because by this time, Kennedy, of course, was dead. So in 1961 and 62, prior, of course, to Birmingham, 
Randolph proposed another march on Washington. This time he said, we're going to send out an army of African American people to Washington to demand the enactment of fair employment legislation and the passage of an increased minimum wage. And he was going to help set up that event. Now, why would they focus on that? Why would they focus on that? This is why. Black unemployment in 61 and 62 was 11 percent. For whites, it was only 5.5 percent. The average annual income for African Americans in 61 and 62 was only $3,500. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to understand for whites, it was only $6,500. But still, that was half, and that was a lot of money back in those days. So Randolph said, calls King, other civil rights leaders together, and says, let's have another march. Let's do another march on Washington, and we'll do it in 1963. So he, Randolph, begins to plan it. Rustin, remember Rustin from, from Montgomery, he becomes the guy who runs the logistics. Where is everything going to take place? Who's going to be there? How are we going to do transportation? How are we going to get a, a podium set up with a microphone and a, a sound system? How's that all going to work out? We have to have uh, food. We have to have water. There was a lot to plan, and that fell in the lap of Rustin. He did a great job. At first, not everybody was on board, but eventually the NAACP got on board. Other groups got on board, and they decided that they were going to have this march. King has involved other civil rights leaders from across the nation. So uh, uh, just before August 28th, when this speech is about to happen in Washington, there are plans that are being made. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? Uh, the city, now you have to remember, Washington was really a city up north with a southern conscience. And so John F. Kennedy, who at first didn't really want to get on board with this march, was really nervous about what was going to happen. Is there going to be violence and bloodshed in the streets of the nation's capital as there was in Birmingham? How are people going to react to this? So there were certain protocols, certain panic measures that were, were put in force by the city of Washington, D.C. for August 28, 1963. As you see here, first of all, elective surgeries were canceled for the day. You could not get elective surgery. The sale of alcohol was prohibited because you did not need the fuel of alcohol, right? F fueling this rage between either of the races. The Washington Senators, who were the, the baseball team at the time, their game was canceled. The, the, the District uh, Columbia uh, General, uh, Court, Court of General Sessions uh, said, look, you guys plan to stay open all night because we're going to be putting people in jail all night long. The podium that uh, was placed uh, there for the march, the sound system wouldn't work. The microphones wouldn't work. The sound system suddenly wouldn't work anymore. And the federal government, the Justice Department, allowed Rustin to get one of their sound systems, get a po new podium for, for the speakers. But what uh, no nobody knew except the Justice Department is the microphone, the sound system was rigged. And if, if anything was going to go wrong, they were going to cut the microphone off and they were going to play a recording of Mahalia Jackson singing, he's got the whole world in his hands and that was going to calm everything down if violence broke out. So you had that going on. Law enforcement officers by the thousands uh, were, were, were placed in the D.C. area. Uh, the Pentagon had 19,000 troops on standby and the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg was on standby just in case they needed to be dropped in to, uh, to calm any problems. There was also a group there called the Guardians and the Guardians were former African American police officers who were there to, to kind of be, you know, mingle through the crowd, mingle in the crowd and if anything went wrong, if tensions began began to mount, they were instructed that they were to begin singing and lead others in singing, We Shall Overcome. So I guess key, uh, the key to calming all, all the tension was going to be people were going to start singing. Well, maybe not. Also, <clears throat> the FBI wiretapped 
king's phone in his hotel, and all of his aides and, and all the civil rights leaders had their uh, phones wiretapped. Now, let's talk about the march itself. The march itself started, of course, on August 28th at 9.30 in Washington at the Washington Monument. And there were, there were blacks there, there were whites there, and there were entertainers there. In fact, there were folk singers because folk music was kind of pushing uh, civil rights. So here you see Joan Baez and there you see Bob Dylan. Uh, they were there. They entertained during the course of the day. But also here you have gospel singers. Again, Mahalia Jackson there on the left. Marian Anderson, the great uh, gospel singer here. She was scheduled to sing more about her momentarily. But after 930, after some of the entertainment, after things kind of got going, and you have to understand, people were arriving in cars. People were arriving by train. People were arriving by buses. They didn't know how many people to expect. But finally, by 11 o'clock, this whole swarm, a mass of people, 250,000 people began to make its way from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial, as you see there by the reflecting pool that, that separates the two. A mass number of people were there at 11 o'clock. It was time to sing the Star Spangled Banner. Who was supposed to sing it that day? It was Marian Anderson. The problem is she got caught back in the rush trying to get from the, the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial and couldn't make it. So a singer named Camilla Williams had to sing the national anthem. Washington Archbishop Patrick O'Boyle gave the invocation and then the speakers began speaking. They were allowed five minutes. Now, most of them were preachers and you know a good preacher is going to go over five minutes and all of them, whether a preacher or not, went over time. King was the last speaker. And that, I have to tell you, that caused a little bit of tension uh, between some of these other, other guys. They were like, well, well, why, does, well, you know, why can't I be last? Why can't I close the show? And then someone reminded them and they said, do you really want to follow Martin if you give your speech? And all of them realized that Martin Luther King was the very best speaker among all of them. And so all of them relented and said, you're right, King needs to go last. He needs to be the one uh, to close the show and, and, and to bring the great drama. But by the time King is, is ready to speak, it's 87 degrees. It's getting hot. People are beginning to leave. But finally, Randolph gets up, goes to the microphone, and introduces King as a man who personifies the moral leadership of this country. Now, let's stop for a moment and talk about the speech itself. This speech in Washington on, on August 28th was one of 350 speeches King would make that entire year, almost one a day. And it was much different. You have to remember, not everybody had heard King speak. Really, only certain people in churches and, and, and people in the civil rights movement, but not everybody across the country had. But today they would because NBC was there, ABC was there, CBS was there. There, there was a satellite called the Telstar communication satellite that would beam this speech literally across the world. The speech itself was planned really over four days by King and his two advisors, uh, Clarence Jones, and Stanley Levinson, they had worked on it. And on the eve, the night before the speech, King was going to give the speech, he met with his aides in the lobby of the Willard Hotel where they were staying and asked for advice. And Jones said, Martin, don't use that part about I have a dream. Leave that part out. Because you have to understand, the first time King had used the I have a dream theme was the year before on uh, November 27, 1962. The first time was in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, in a speech he gave uh, at Booker T. Washington High School. Just a few months earlier, he had used it in Chicago. A few weeks earlier, he had used it in Detroit. So by that summer, he was using the I have a dream theme more and more. And Jones said, you know, maybe you're overusing it. You'll have to decide. So finally, King stood up in the, in the lobby. He said, OK, my brothers, thank you for your advice. I'm going to go consult with my Lord in my hotel room and I'm going to finish the speech. He goes upstairs, he prays about his speech, he writes out the outline and finishes the outline, 
at midnight and he wrote it out in longhand. Now, this is what we know. See, all the speakers had to submit their speeches to the organizers because the organizers did not want any, anybody saying anything bad about the president. They needed him on their side. So they all had to submit the speech. King had to submit his speech. And on the speech he submitted, there is no record of the I have a dream portion that we know he uses the very next day. Well, why not? Why is it not there? Was he kind of trying to, to, to hide his climax? You know, this is going to be the, the highest point of my speech. I don't want people to know about this. I, I want to kind of spring it on them. You know, good preachers, good, good speakers do that from time to time. Or had, or, or had he not decided to use it? We do know that Levinson reports, one of his advisors, Levinson reports, that someone in the hotel room beside King heard him rehearsing the speech the night before, and King was rehearsing the I have a dream portion of the speech. So we'll never know. Did he intend to use it? Did he not intend to use it? We know that he did, but there is no text in the submitted speech. He finally falls asleep around 4 a.m., goes to bed, and the next night, or the next day he gets up, he goes to the rally in Washington, the other speakers speak, and then Randolph introduces him. As he is about to take the podium, he turns again to Harry Belafonte and he says, I wonder if the president will really understand what this day is all about, if he will really understand the significance. Later, King would make this comment. He would say, so we stood there facing Mr. Lincoln and facing ourselves and our destiny and facing the future and facing God. Now, the speech is interesting. He starts slowly, only 77 words the first minute. And by the way, uh, he, he, went, he went way over his time and was much longer than the other speakers. But only a, a, very, a very slow building, building, building. And there are allusions in the speech. He alludes to the Gettysburg Address, of course, right? And, and the, the emancipation. Of course, there's Lincoln right there. He alludes to the Constitution that all men are created equal. He alludes to the Declaration of Independence. You know, we, we all are, uh, should have life, liberty, and, and, and the ability to pursue happiness. He alludes, of course, to the Bible. He's a preacher. And, and to geography across the nation. But this speech is really structured based on repetitions. And the first repetition that he uses is the repetition of now, the fierce urgency of now. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to make justice a reality. Then there was the second repetition, and it's the, second rep it's the repetition of not being satisfied. As long as Negroes are victims of police brutality, we will not be satisfied. As long as Negroes have no access to lodging in hotels and motels, we will not be satisfied. As long as the Negro's mobility is from the smaller ghetto to a larger one, we will not be satisfied. So he's about halfway through his speech. When suddenly people who were there, witnesses, said they could hear Mahalia Jackson who was standing behind him. And she starts saying, tell them about the dream, Martin. Martin, tell them about the dream. Tell them about the dream, Martin. Martin Luther King takes his prepared notes and slides them over to the side to the left of his podium and begins to extemporize, extemporate, what's the word? He goes off the cuff, I guess is the best way to say it. But he begins, he launches into this thing called I Have a Dream, which made his speech famous. And I want to read a portion of that to you. He says this, I say to you today, my friends, though even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up Live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. 
I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of, of, of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day my four little children will live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. I have a dream. He concludes his speech with two more repetitions. One is faith. Faith to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope, to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. And then his final repetition is, let freedom ring. Let freedom ring across this country. He hit on two major themes. One is nonviolence. We will use soul force and not physical force. He also hit on the themes of the destiny of whites and blacks being tied together. Very much unlike Malcolm X, who was also a civil rights leader at the same time, who contradicted King's tactics. So, the speech is over. It concludes to thunderous applause. There you see King is waving and and he's being congratulated. A limousine comes over and and takes all of the major players to the White House. And as you see here, King is meeting with, uh, that's that's, uh, of course, the President of the United States. That's John F. Kennedy. And on his right-hand side is Randolph. And right beside the very tall white man in the back over here on the right-hand side, that's Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Robert Kennedy was there. So all the major players are there. Kennedy is elated and now he's fully behind civil rights like he he never was before congratulates king king is is very humble and says you know other people gave very good speeches too and 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 king says this he says you know this this is what happens the march had subpoenaed the conscience of the nation before the judgment seat of morality now we know a couple of things happened to King right, right after this speech. Certainly, he did become the moral leader of the nation. And the next year in December, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. We also know this about the outcome of the speech and certainly about the spotlight that was focused on King. We read William uh, Sullivan, the FBI assistant director for domestic intelligence, made this comment. He said, we must mark him now, if we have not done so before, as the most dangerous Negro of the future of this nation. Now, certainly, the speech in Washington was probably King's high water mark. After the speech, he saw violence break out in the north, Uh, When uh, people demonstrated and when they protested, he was certainly against the violence that broke out there. He went into a a time of of great depression. Uh, He also uh, was, he came out against the Vietnam War, which turned Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, against him. So he was walking through this valley of the shadow of death, but that did not mean that he did not fight other battles for civil rights. We know that he did, three in particular. One was in Selma, Alabama in 1965. The other was in Chicago, Illinois in 1966. And then there was the Poor People's March in 1968, which was planned on Washington. Now, in Selma, you remember uh, King led a group of uh, civil rights activists uh, who were seeking to vote, to get a voting right, right uh, across the Pettit Bridge and, and stared down George Wallace and his uh, troopers at that point, and a Voting Rights Act was passed. In Chicago, 
King not only supported civil rights, and it, was, it had to do with fair housing agreements. African Americans couldn't uh, get fair housing treatment. Uh, King actually moved into the slums of Chicago and lived there with his family until there was uh, some movement from the city government to allow African Americans resources that would give them better housing. Now, in 1968, King was planning a, uh, another march on Washington, the Poor People's March, and, and, and it, everything was in full swing. This was going to happen. But then Lyndon Baines Johnson came out and said, I'm not going to run for president of the United States. I'm not running for re-election. And everybody realized that Robert Kennedy would be the Democratic nominee. And so King called off the Poor People's March because he knew that Kennedy was going to support civil rights and didn't want to do anything to, to uh, dampen uh, his election. He wanted him elected president of the United States. Instead, he turned his attention to Memphis, Tennessee. And in 1968, he was in Memphis for a garbage worker strike. And violence had broken out. And King went down there to help organize those workers into something more nonviolent so that they could get better rights. Now, on April 7th, 1968, Martin Luther King preached his final sermon at the Mason Temple in Memphis. And I want to read to you a, a portion of what he said. It's very moving. He said this, Well, I don't know what will happen now, but it really doesn't matter to me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. I won't mind. Like everybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And He's allowed me to go to up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Most of April 8th was spent by King in his room, room 306 of the Lorraine Hotel. He was preparing for a demonstration that would take place a few days later in Memphis. He had been invited by a, a, a local reverend, Dr. Samuel Keyes, uh, that evening to go to dinner. About 250 feet Across from the Lorraine Hotel, there was another hotel. It was kind of seedy and, and very transient. And about 3.15 that day, a man named John Willard checked in and rented room 5B. 5B overlooked the balcony of King's room. One hour later, Mr. Willard went out. He came back and he had purchased a pair of binoculars. He had a Remington 30-06 rifle and a box of soft point bullets. Next to Willard's room, there was a bathroom whose window granted Willard an unobscured view of King's balcony. And so he perched there and he waited. Samuel Kyles and his chauffeur came to the hotel, the Lorraine Hotel, to pick up King for dinner that night. King was not ready to go. He looked around and he said, where's my favorite tie? He found his favorite tie. He put uh, the tie on and was ready to go. Abernathy, his longtime friend and best friend, right, was there. And he said, wait a minute, Martin, I need to go to the restroom. I want to sprinkle on some cologne so I'll be ready for dinner. I'll smell good. And he turned around and went to the bathroom. And in the interim, King walked out opened the glass of, of the balcony, walked out onto the balcony, stood there and looked down, and there was a chauffeur, Solomon Jones was there, Jesse Jackson was there, uh, Andrew Young, who became the, the mayor of Atlanta, was there, and a local, a local musician named Ben Branch was there. Suddenly, Abernathy claims to have heard what sounded like an explosion right outside the room. He runs out of the bathroom into the room and looks out onto the balcony and King is sprawled out, as you see here, with one leg sticking out 
of the balcony rails with a three-inch bullet hole in his head. This happened about 6.08 p.m. on, uh, on April 8th. By the time that uh, anyone could come to, to help King, King was already dead by the time that they put him in the ambulance. After the shot was fired, this man Willard, who we know was not Will, John Willard, but was James Earl Ray, jumped into his Mustang, dropped his rifle, and fled from the premises. He was later caught, he was later tried, and he was later convicted for the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Although King did not want a large funeral, that was not ever going to be the case. And as you see here, he is in his casket. He is surrounded by his family on one side. And then Abernathy here, John Lewis is there, who later was a congressman of Georgia, and Andrew Young stand. And they're about to shut the, the casket and the career on the civil rights uh, leader, Martin Luther King. So what do we make of all this? What do we make of King's life? What do we make of his successes, of his failures? What do we make of his preaching? What do we make of Martin Luther King? Well, I'm not King and certainly don't claim to speak for him, but if he were here, I think he would say this. I think he would say, you know what? We as a people need to focus less on what separates us and more on what we have in common. And truly then we can pursue life and liberty and happiness and, and do it together. I certainly believe that he would repeat what he had said in 1963 in Washington, that we should judge people by the content of their character, their kindness, their virtue, and their integrity. And then we could live in harmony together. I certainly think he would look at us and go, don't be angry. Don't be angry. Don't be violent. Let's be peaceful. Because we know that love is always going to triumph over hate and love will lead us to a brighter day. I think that's what King and his speech and his life teach us and that's what we should do too. Amen and amen.